understanding this invisible hand idea is actually really important for a public sector economics class. Um, even though you're not going to be creating your own firms and um, selling things to people, um, that's not your job as, as a public manager or a public policy person. Um, you're interested in um, local government and state government and nonprofit organizations, which are not really market organizations. But the reason we care about that is because you have a very important role to play with this world of the invisible hand. Um, the invisible hand only works if there are other institutions undergirding the whole system. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If, if you remember with those three circles, we had kind of private property was one circle and then you had markets within that and then firms within that. Um, if you're only focused on the market, there are other institutions beneath that market that make everything work, like private property. And the only way private property works is with a public sector that kind of ensures that, that you can have that. Um, so that is um, a very important reason to, to care about this stuff, even if you're not at all interested in entrepreneurship or starting a business or anything like that. Um, we care about this invisible hand because as public managers, economics is crucial to what we do. Um, which is why we make you take this class. So um, one really important question to ask at the beginning of this is what is economics? Like, What is this stuff that we're even studying? Um, so far we've talked about two different things. We've talked about like money um, and trading and buying and selling, um, which is what most of you think of when you think about economics. In the introductory survey, um, lots of you, when I asked what do you think of when you think of economics, um, lots of you put like the stock market or money or selling stuff, um, which is part of it, but that's not all. We've also so far talked about institutions and norms and what happens when you walk through a doorway. That has nothing to do with money. Um, that has to do with human interactions. And so what economics is, is it's not kind of just focused on money and finance. Finance isn't even a part of it. Um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average isn't really economics. Um, what it really is, it's this, it's, how, it's the study of how people interact with each other and their environment as they move around in the world and do stuff, um, as they provide their livelihoods um, and how they interact with their, their natural surroundings. And so that is kind of a, a much more broad definition of economics here. And it's, it's somewhat confusing because if you think about like the social sciences, um, you have things like political science that studies how power works and how politics works. You have things like sociology that studies how societies work. Um, economics is kind of a mix of the two. It's how people interact with each other, and so that's the, that's the sociology aspect of it, um, and how there are power dynamics and how they interact with each other. And so that's the uh, political science -y part of it. But then it's also this idea of how they provide for their livelihoods. Um, and that's the economics part of it. And so it's, it's really how people interact with each other with the purpose of supporting themselves and gaining profit and doing things in the world to improve themselves. Um, so that's, that's kind of where economics fits in this whole world of the social sciences here. Um, one very common misconception is this idea that economics is the study of money, and it absolutely is not. A few years ago, there was um, this random troll guy on Twitter here that was complaining that um, anybody with a PhD, or the fact that people with PhDs in economics are not billionaires is a sign that it's a, it's a dumb field and nobody knows anything about money. Um, but again, like economics is, has nothing to do with investing in the stock market and earning lots of money. Um, that's finance and even like finance people aren't becoming billionaires because that's not how finance works. Um, and so this is like, this is not what economics is. Um, that whole notion of like the fact that no economists are billionaires, um, this political scientist here kind of has a rebuttal there of, here of like not every person with a, or the fact that not every person with a PhD in geology is not a rock should tell you all that you need to know about that particular field of study. Um, just because you study something doesn't mean you're like really good at practicing it. Um, and so even finance people who study like the stock market um, are not expert investors um, also because the stock market is just a weird place. Um, so again, economics is not a money thing, though money is involved. Um, with economic models, all of these like supply going up and demand going down and crossing, these are all just kind of models that we talk about. And none of these models are perfect. They're all going to be wrong. 
um, and they're never going to make perfect predictions. And so even with those with those playing cards they showed you where I tried to force the price to be at six, often the price settled at six dollars. But sometimes you would find really enterprising people that would be able to sell a paperclip for like ten dollars and they'd find like a super good deal. And that's not normal that it was supposed to just be six. And so something happened to break that model. And so lots of people who don't like economic complain that it's not perfect and the models are not great and it makes all sorts of assumptions about how people act. Um, there's actually a term for this, um, this homo economicus. Um, in most economic models, there's this assumption that everybody, these fake people who are interacting with each other are perfectly rational. They think about long-term consequences of all their decisions and they, they plan out kind of the costs and benefits of every decision they make and that's how they decide to do something. Um, but that actually doesn't fit reality. Um, and so lots of people like to dismiss economics on that basis, that all the assumptions that you make with supply and demand and everybody's going to rationally stick at wherever they intersect, that doesn't happen. Um, and then there's this idea of having crystal ball math. This comes especially into play with like macroeconomics where people are trying to predict recessions and depressions um, and inflation levels and kind of broader economic trends. Those all come from like these massive mathematical models that are super complex and scary. Um, and those are wrong too. And so what lots of policymakers like to do is they say, oh, this economic stuff is dumb because it's not actually showing us anything. It's always wrong. And it's kind of based on, on bad assumptions, um, which arguably you could say is true. Um, they are bad assumptions, but that's not the point of having a model. The point of having a model is being able to kind of understand the certain dynamics of how the world works and then make decisions based on that. And so really, what you have with economics, the whole reason we're doing this in an MPA class, um, in an MPP class, is that um, you need some way of having data out in the world, like prices of people bouncing around into each other, um, and then being able to model that and make some sort of, uh, analyze that data somehow, and then come to some sort of conclusion and make a decision. Um, so if you're trying to decide to build a new freeway or expand um, access to daycare or make pre-K um, kind of a, a universal program. There are all sorts of costs and benefits that you need to think about when you do that. Um, there are all sorts of different ways people are going to react. And so you need to be able to predict how people might react to policy changes. Um, and that's all based on economic models. And so you need to be able to run cost benefit analyses. You need to be able to understand incentives. Um, and be able to incorporate that into your analysis. And ultimately, you're going to write some sort of memo that says we should do X, Y, and Z. Um, but those recommendations should be based on some sort of model and some sort of analysis of data in a structured way. And economics gives you a language of doing this. So one of the reasons we do this in an MPA and MPP program you know, nationwide is that it's the language of policy. Um, when you're talking about implementing a new policy, you talk about costs and you talk about benefits and you talk about marginal utility um, and you talk about supply and demand and all these vocabulary terms that we're going to learn throughout the rest of the semester here. These are very common policy oriented terms and so you need to understand um, what people are talking about. Um, you have to be able to speak the language. And so if you show up at some economics planning meeting with the governor's office, they're going to start throwing out words like um, um, diminishing marginal returns and you have to understand what they mean. You have to be able to hang out with these economists. Um, so that's one main reason we have to learn this stuff is so that you can keep up with what's happening. Um, but also markets need referees. And so when we were talking about this invisible hand idea where everybody in a market just kind of bounces into each other and a price just naturally emerges, that only works if there is private property and if there's a secure place to work and there's a secure place to make these transactions. And if somebody is governing the money supply and if like there's this whole infrastructure that has to exist so that the invisible hand can do its thing. And so you as public sector workers and public servants and nonprofit workers are essentially those referees. Um, you are working to ensure that capitalist institutions can continue to do their thing. Um, and so that's why it's crucial for you to understand this stuff because you're essentially helping to govern it. Um, so with this language of policy idea, you'll often see reports that look like this. Um, this is a study on the effect of Medicaid, in, the expansion of Medicaid in Oregon. Um, following the Affordable Care Act in 2013, Oregon decided to expand Medicaid beyond 
um, the legal requirement and they used a lottery system to offer f the essentially free medical um, coverage to anybody who was selected in this lottery. And they did that on purpose so they could study the effect of receiving extra medical care and access to medical, medical insurance and, and coverage to people who previously didn't have it. And so if you read all of these studies, it uses all sorts of econometrics terms or statistical terms about difference and difference analysis and regression discontinuity and um, marginal units of uh, medical care and other things that are kind of over your head if you're not trained in this stuff. You need to be able to understand this, this, these kind of reports. Um, similarly, there's all sorts of cost-benefit um, analyses that you see in the world that um, help drive policy. Um, most federal legislation has to go through um, a scoring procedure in the Congressional Budget Office that determines its costs and benefits. Um, you have to be able to understand what they're talking about when they, when they talk about um, in, or interest rates and discount factors and other things like that. Um, again, this is the language of policy. You need to understand this. Um, going back to the, this idea of markets needing referees, um, if you don't have specific kind of um, basic foundational requirements in a market system, things collapse. If private property is not secure, um, then it's really hard to trade and it's really hard to, to go um, kind of go buy and sell stuff from other people um, because you have to spend lots of effort like protecting your stuff. Um, if we were doing that paperclip game, um, one of the rules I set in at the beginning of the class is that you can't steal a paperclip from other people. Um, because theoretically, if I didn't set that rule, it would be perfectly legal for somebody, instead of going around and, and trying to find a good deal, to just go take people's paper clips from them um, and then come up to the front of the room and get their bonus candy because it was free for them. Um, and that's like illegal. We have rules against that. We have laws against that. Um, but those laws come from the public sector. If we didn't have those laws, then every person would be responsible essentially for providing their own private security. Um, and then you have to spend extra money on having like bodyguards and and like a fence around your house and guards and guard towers and like that's nuts. And so having kind of a secure world of laws that lets you make these transactions in a safe way, that is one really great way of, of having a more free market that works. Um, if markets aren't competitive, then it gets really hard to engage in transactions. Um, if you get a firm that somehow starts making tons and tons of profits and then they start buying out other firms and then they end up being like the only company that sells something, then they become a monopoly and then they can charge whatever they want. Um, if we go back to the airport example, um, prices get so high that people are unable to purchase a lot or they're, they, they feel awful buying a bottle of water for $3. Um, and if there is just one company in the, in the airport that was, was responsible for selling the water, they could raise their prices even more. They could, we could see like $7 bottles of water and that would be the only way to get water. And then suddenly tons of people are out of the market and they can't actually buy water. Um, and then they're kind of left out. Um, and this happens in all sorts of realms. It's not just water in, um, in airports. It can be houses. Um, We'll talk later in the semester about how federal policies um, and banks specifically were able to lock all sorts of minorities out of buying houses um, by mapping, like creating zones on maps that was like you could not give loans to people who wanted to buy houses in specific zones. Um, and so that created kind of an uncompetitive market, which then favored some people over others and created long lasting inequality and um, racial disparities. It was a bad thing. Um, and so if you have markets that aren't competitive, you have all sorts of kind of negative consequences because of that. Um, also, if you have firms that are run by entrenched interests, then you get kind of incompetent firms. So instead of having like a company that is run by a CEO that is hired from some national search to find kind of the best CEO out there. Um, you might have a company that is run by the son of the son of the founder and they're like an idiot and kind of an awful manager, but they're there because they were like, it's a family thing. And so you get, um, but they, they're able to kind of maintain control over the company um, because of 
all sorts of entrenched interests. They have con close connections with the government. They do all sorts of kind of shady things and they can stay kind of in power within their firm and it, it can lead to suboptimal things. They're not going to create the best things. They're not going to create the safest things and it's not efficient. And so if you have any of these situations here, um, you're going to have a less efficient market and a less equitable market. Um, and so public sector organizations can intervene here and kind of help adjust that. So basically, these public sector institutions matter a lot. The whole public sector provides the backdrop for capitalist institutions to work. The only way you can have private property and markets and firms is if you have kind of a robust public sector sitting behind it, making sure everything can keep spinning and working. Um, and so it's just kind of behind the scenes. So you all are the behind the scenes people, which is why we care about this stuff in an MPA and MPP program.